Well, I'd like to start tonight's video with a massive thank you to all of you who've joined the subreddit Dr. Creepin's Vault. We have just hit 2,000 members over there on the Reddit, and that means one thing, of course, more and more stories for me to read to you. And with that in mind, I've chosen three for tonight's video. Three very different stories, all weird, wonderful, and macabre in their own way. So we have a bit of a babysitter story, a story about Rokel, and a mysterious trip to an abandoned town in the middle of nowhere. Sound good to you? Does? Well, okay then. So, I think it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Penelope lifted her finger from the doorbell and wrapped both hands behind her back. The ebony wood door in a golden frame, which most likely cost more than her monthly salary, opened. She was greeted by the wide smile of a black-haired middle-aged woman in a skin-tight black dress. Shiny silver pearls and earrings complemented her attire. Her husband, wearing a beige suit and a big golden watch, stood one step behind her. Peeking from the interior, a twelve-year-old girl in a green sweater waved, smiling wide, revealing braces. The woman put her hand on the side of Penelope's shoulder and slightly tilted her head. I am so grateful to you, young miss. I sincerely hope this wasn't an inconvenience for you. She smiled with her mouth closed and eyebrows pulled together. Not at all. I love babysitting, especially your little girl, Mrs. Mobley. She's so well-mannered. Penelope, hands still behind her back and feet glued together, kept her calm smile. You know what to do. We'll be back at two o'clock. Gabriel, our limousine is waiting. Mrs. Mobley grabbed her husband by the wrist and led him out into the clean white corridor. Gabriel turned his head and waved at his daughter, who eagerly waved back. Enjoy your anniversary dinner. Penelope turned to the girl and hugged her. She was a short woman and stood a little taller than the little girl. Oh, this is so awesome. I haven't seen you in ages, Pen. She hugged her tightly and welcomed her in. Not a trace of dust or filth could be seen in the two-story apartment. The walls were white and covered with simplistic paintings. All pieces of furniture were a combination of the same ebony wood as the door, and dark blue leather. The stairs leading to the second floor had gold ornamented railing. It's only been three months, Nina. Penelope flattened the back of her red summer dress and sat on the long couch, facing the widescreen TV. So, how's school? She threw her small backpack to the side. That's the first question you always ask me. Nina frowned and crossed her hands. Boring as always. Nothing cool happens in private schools. She turned her head aside. Penelope smiled, gently put her hand on Nina's chin, and turned her head to face hers. Well, the stories I tell of my school days, they aren't cool in any way. Don't go looking for trouble. With a burst of energy, Nina jumped on the couch and wrapped her arms around her knees. Oh, since you brought it up, can you tell me another awesome story? She hid her evil smile behind her knees. <laughs> Your standard for awesome is set really low. Your folks should really give you access to the internet. Penelope had tried to talk them into it before, but always failed. Okay, I'll tell you one. Action, romance, horror. She raised one eyebrow and smiled. The little girl opened her mouth. Ah! She shut it and closed her eyes. Horror! Nina yelled, eyes wide open now. Horror? You usually choose action. Penelope began to think. Hmm. I ever tell you about... Her voice gradually became quieter. The bogeyman. She whispered. Pan, don't feed me children's fairy tales. Nina frowned. Ah, Boogeyman is only a nickname. Penelope's voice shifted back to normal. A nickname 
of a very scary man. She got her quiet, lower-pitched narrator voice back. The way she said those words, hmm, sure got Nina's attention. This is back when I was thirteen. One day, a friend ran up to me, all frightened, and said a man had been following her from a distance. This man wore a black hoodie and was almost seven feet tall. Nina hadn't blinked once since Penelope started her story. Next day, another girl at school said he followed her, but this time he was even closer. A third girl came the other day. This time he was only thirty feet away. Penelope had been slowly moving her head towards Nina, and now whispered inches from her ear. I thought they were all messing with me, but that night, when I walked home, I could feel I wasn't alone. I looked back and saw that exact same man in the distance. I turned and quickened my pace. In a minute, I glanced back again. He was thirty feet away. I went behind a corner and bolted. Mere seconds later, I heard him running too. I turned around as I ran and saw this huge man in full sprint, hand out to catch me, and then... Penelope took a deep breath and prepared to jump-scare the little girl. The lights in the apartment turned off. The room was pitch black. Nina shrieked and stumbled off the couch. Penelope, calmly but curiously, looked around. This isn't the kind of apartment building to have power outages. She found Nina's shoulder in the darkness and pulled her closer. <laughs> Chill out. This is a power outage. They happen from time to time. She put her hand on the girl's cheek. Power will be back any moment. A solid minute passed and Penelope sighed. The light from her phone illuminated the entire room. She could now see Nina's panicked face. Penelope couldn't remember the first time this happened to her, but when she thought about it, an outage could be horrifying, especially the first time you experience it. The safety that light provides disappears in a flash, and we're reminded how dark the night truly is, without our technology to guard us. Right. I remember we learned about this at school. Nina calmed down. I'll go and talk with one of the neighbors. As she got up, the girl grabbed her by the hand. Mom doesn't let me have a phone. I can't light up the room. Any candles? We have some, but but they're well, special or some crap. Mom would kill me if I lit them. Okay, but don't tell your old folks I let you out of the apartment. Penelope held Nina's hand and walked out. Unlike the apartment, where the light illuminated the entire room, the corridor stretched into darkness. Penelope pocketed her copy of the key and closed the door. They carefully approached the nearest door and rang the bell. A man in a bathrobe, hair covered in shampoo, with a candle in his hand, opened it. Oh, don't you just hate these fu- He stopped mid-sentence, once seeing the little girl. Oh, <clears throat> don't you just hate these outages. These apartments aren't cheap. I'd expect better maintenance. We were hoping you- Someone on this floor knew what was going on. Penelope tried to be calm. Her phone shut off. It cut her off guard as she clearly remembered charging it before coming here. Now that the light from it was gone, the door to their apartment was swallowed by darkness. Both sides of the corridor were pitch black. It wouldn't happen to have an extra flashlight to land. Penelope smiled. Sadly, no. I can't seem to turn them on. He looked at her phone, and then back to her. Same thing with mine. He moved aside, and revealed his living room, lit up by candles. Could you lend us a candle? She could see her breath as she said those words. A chill went through her spine, and she could feel Nina's grip tighten. The entire corridor had become colder. Everyone's breath was now visible. All three of them ran into the apartment. The man shut the door, 
and pulled his candle closer to his chest. They lost control of their bodies for a moment. Something on a primal level forced them to flee towards the warm candles. The man's home was almost identical to Nina's, but had lit candles on all the tables. The rooms were entirely lit and lacked any dark corners. Oh, I, I wasn't the only one who felt that, right? The man took deep breaths. Definitely not, sir. Nina slowly loosened the hug around Penelope's waist as she calmed down. Someone must have left the entrance door open. Penelope wasn't the bravest of people, but she would always stand up if no one else did. I'm sorry we just jumped into your apartment. Don't worry, you can stay here until the power comes back on. The man looked nervous. And I'm scared of the dark. I could use someone to protect me. He looked at Nina and smiled. I should change. He picked some of the shampoo off of his head. You two feel like home. The man walked up the stairs. Just as they were going to sit, Penelope's head snapped towards the door. She put her finger to Nina's mouth and attempted to listen carefully. There it was again. A very subtle sound from down the corridor. She let go of Nina and silently walked up to the door. Now she could hear it better. Footsteps. Whoever walked outside tried to be quiet. Penelope signaled Nina to sit down. She could define the sound better once it was closer. Naked human feet, accompanied by three clicks, one after the other. It came closer and closer till she could hear it only a few feet away on the other side. The footsteps stopped in front of the door. Something sharp slowly scraped against it. Penelope's heart was beating rapidly. Even though it was dark on the other side, she looked through the peephole. As expected, only darkness welcomed her gaze, but that same primal fear reappeared. I got this real fun board game we can play. The man broke the silence as he walked down the stairs with a colourful box in his hands. Penelope's head instinctively rotated towards him. The lights came back on. Penelope's phone screen shone through her pocket. The man's TV turned on and filled the room with screaming and yelling from some comedy movie he was watching. Penelope quickly looked back through the peephole and only saw an empty corridor. Yes, 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 the light's back, Nina cheered. Penelope walked to her with a smile. See, I told you everything would be cool. Yeah. The man looked at his box with disappointment. The light is back. He slowly put it on the table and walked up to them. You two, have a good night. He put his hand on the doorknob. Oh, the lights might go out again. And who'll be here to protect you? Nina smiled. Hand still on the doorknob, he looked at her in surprise, with a slightly open mouth. Penelope looked at the time on her phone, and then back to the girl. Two hours till bedtime, Pan. Nina tilted her head. Okay, if it's cool with the man, we can stay, but only for an hour. The three stayed up another three hours, laughing at some horrible action movie, eating chips and playing that same board game. Sometimes, the darkest of moments can lead to the brightest of days. Before I start this story, I want to preface it with this. This will be told in the third person, as it's a story from my grandfather. He told this to me the last time I went down to see him in California. He wasn't doing so good, and I wanted to get a lot more time with him, so I made the nine and a half hour drive from Oregon to visit him. Now, 
some backstory about my grandfather. He grew up in Texas and was a true rough and tumble guy. Went through the Navy for six years and was always a tough individual. To put it into perspective, just a few years back, when he was 75, he was eating dinner at a McDonald's with my grandma when a trucker came in and started running his mouth and calling everyone names and making an ass of himself. My grandfather had enough and said, Hey, these people came here to eat their dinner, not to hear you make an ass of yourself. The trucker, now finding a target, started walking over to him. As he got to the table, he said, Oh yeah, what are you going to do about it, old man? That's when my grandfather stood up and gave him a vicious right hook, and then said, Time to go, to my grandmother. They got about five miles outside of town before the cops caught up to him and took him to jail. All of the people in the McDonald's backed him up and they were about to let him go when they got more information about the trucker from the hospital. They said that he'd broken his face and the bone around his eye was crushed. They ended up letting him go due to the fact that it was clearly self-defense. But that just shows my point on how tough this man was. Now, to the actual story. So, I went down there to visit him, and he looked like he wanted to get something off his chest. Grandpa, do you want to talk about something? You look like you have something you want to say. Me thinking it was going to be something about him passing, or something he'd done in the past. Well, I was wrong. So wrong. His eyes travelled to the Roadkill Cafe sign that he's had ever since I've known him. Did I ever tell you that I started and co-owned the very first Roadkill Cafe? I kind of started. Those things were real? He looked at me directly. They are real. There are a few now. But they were more of a thing back in the day. I pondered this. I'd seen the signs and the shirts and so on but never thought anyone would eat roadkill, let alone pay for it. But apparently, it was a thing. What got you started doing that? I asked curiously. He paused and took a deep sigh and told me. Well, I kind of wish he hadn't, but I need to share this. If I don't, blood could be on my hands. I'll try to retell it as best I can. This was back in 1945. He was travelling in Arizona at the time, and was going down the famous Route 66. As he was travelling down the stretch of road, he came across a deer carcass in the middle of the road. He said, well, he couldn't just leave it there. It could cause an accident, and it was disrespectful to the animal. That was my grandfather. Always has been a hunter, and had a deep respect for animal life and the wilderness. As he pulled over and shut off his car, he saw that the deer moved and he stopped short. Oh, crap. It's still alive, he thought, as he went back to his car and pulled out his thirty-eight revolver that he always kept with him. As he made his way back, he saw its eyes. They were milky and white, and flies were covering it and maggots spilling out of it. But I saw it move. He leaned in at this point. I knew something was wrong then. I just had this deep feeling of dread. As he edged closer to it, and grabbed a stick from the side of the road to poke it, he was still apprehensive. All of a sudden, black, motley-looking tendrils came out of the beast and started whipping around and grabbed his arm that was holding the stick. He pulled back and was understandingly freaked out, kept trying to pull him closer and closer to it. As it got him closer, it began to almost have a seizure, and then it split down the middle, and he saw its guts, as well as rows of teeth in its body cavity, its trunk opening and shutting in anticipation of its meal. He pulled back once more, brought up his revolver, and fired three shots into its mouth. He paused then, and looked at me, seeing me with a look of disbelief. He looked somber for a moment and said, oh, I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. I could tell that he truly believed this had happened, 
and that it had profoundly impacted him. Go on, I believe you, I said with a reassuring tone. He went on. After he'd shot it, he screeched so loud he had to cover his ears, and then a black, bubbling substance started coming out of the deer thing as the screeching slowly died down. The tendrils released their grip on his arm, and he noticed he was bleeding. He saw why very soon. The tendrils were covered in barbs, and they'd sliced into his arm. He backed away from the thing, and went back to his car and grabbed a rag he carried with him for spills and the like from his glove box and wrapped his arms in it. He sat down in the car and was watching the thing, making sure it didn't move. After calming down, and ten minutes had passed, he decided to leave well enough alone and get out of there. Plus he couldn't stand getting near that thing, understandably. He started driving down the road, and he saw another corpse in the middle. This one was a rabbit. He drove around it, remembering what had happened the last time. Good thing, too, because as he drove by and saw it in the rearview mirror, he started moving after his car. Not fast, just with an odd, unnatural hopping. He sped up and then saw another corpse in the middle of the road, and then another and another. Soon he was having to drive around another corpse every mile or so, that was when his car started to sputter, and he looked at the gas meter. It was getting close to empty. He looked up and saw a sign for gas in five miles. Oh, thank God, he said under his breath, as his arms stung. He drove the last five miles with a constant anticipation of danger. Every once in a while, driving around another animal corpse, he finally made it to the gas station, and saw that the perimeter was surrounded by corpses. As he poured around them to the gas pump, he heard shouting. He looked around for its source, when he spotted several people inside the gas station waving him down. That was when the corpses started moving with their sickening hopping towards them. They hopped with a sickening slurping sound and landed with a splat, leaving bits of rotting flesh behind. He ran into the gas station as they opened the doors for him. He ran in and leapt and landed on the ground. I see that you had a run-in with those beasties too, a gruff-looking man said. He extended his hand to my grandfather and helped him up. What the hell are those things? he exclaimed. The man stepped back and helped him up. I don't rightly know. I know they're ambush predators at the very least, and they're mean and strong. Other than that, I have no clue. Ambush predators. And then it clicked. They didn't move until a car had passed or had stopped. Plus, they weren't very fast and moved awkwardly. Hmm, that makes sense, he said to the man. I suppose I should introduce myself, being as we're stuck in this predicament. The name's Carl. Yours? Al, oh, my grandfather said back to him and shook his hand. It was then that he looked around and saw that there were two other people in the gas station. They had either run out of gas or had a run in with the creatures and had had to abandon their vehicles from the looks of it. How long have you guys been here? Al asked. A couple of days or so, but we have a plan to get out of here. We just needed extra muscle, and look and behold, here you are, Carl said with a sarcastic tone. Oh yeah, what's the plan? Al asked as he sat down. Just as Carl was about to explain, they heard a commotion outside. They saw a car pull up and a man getting out to pump gas. They all start yelling for the man to run. He looks around confused, then flips on the bird, thinking they were messing with it. And that's when a corpse hopped closer to the man, but he didn't notice, until the tendrils launched out and wrapped around the man's face and neck and pulled him towards it. It then split open and showed its guts and rows of jagged teeth, pulled his head inside of it 
and bit down. Silence the man's screams as a fountain of blood jutted out of the creature's mouth, and other corpses started hopping closer and faster than normal due to the prospect of feeding. The first creature was making a contented sighing sound. It trembled as it ate the man. The others followed suit as they launched out tendrils that latched onto the man and started tearing him apart. Well, now's as good a time as any. Let's get out of here and kill these things while they're distracted, Gull said, and Al and everyone else agreed. He pulled a pump out and grabbed a lighter and a jagged mop handle. He handed the mop handle to Al and said, You keep them at bay while I light these things on fire. Al nodded. They burst out of the doors of the gas station, and they made right for the ones feeding first. Carl started pumping, and then put the lighter to the gas, and burned the creatures alive with his makeshift flamethrower. They screeched, and let go of the dead man as they tried to flee. Didn't get far, as the flames took them quickly. The others followed suit soon, and the gas station was clear. Right when they were calming down, one of the burnt creatures split open, and a black thing came out. It was like a ball of everything. Different limbs and animal pieces. It tumbled away like a tumbleweed, made it to the desert, and then burrowed in. They all stopped and looked at each other. They all had the same idea. These things were parasitic, and either killed animals or infested them after being hit by a car or by some other natural form of death. So, they all came up with a plan. They would scour the roads and collect any dead animals in three-man teams and make sure that these things didn't have a host. That worked for a few months, but soon they were running out of funds and out of people to do it. So Carl had the bright idea to start butchering the meat and selling it. And that was how the Roadkill Cafe was born. Sadly, they've all but closed, said my grandfather Al. So you guys kept this up and never told anyone? I asked him. Hmm, who would believe us? Only people who'd seen these things would believe. And the people that did usually joined us. And, well, we spread through the poor states and the desert states. Most of us have gotten older. Since we did such a good job keeping everything clean, well, we haven't seen the creatures for a long time now. But with us gone, and a lot of the roads being unpatrolled for the most part, I doubt they'll be gone for long. He paused for a bit and said, Thank you for listening. Please be careful on your way home. I left the next day, and I decided to take a scenic route back home, through some of the desert areas, because, well, it's something we never really see. It quickly outgrew its novelty, I can tell you. That's when I saw a corpse of a desert rabbit in the middle of the road. Tire tracks across its split body. Remembering my grandfather's story, I kept driving. The rearview mirror. I could have swore I saw it move in an odd hopping motion. Coming after my car. After being married for over 35 years, Ed and Martha retired and decided to drive across the country like they'd always dreamed. They waited until the kids had grown up and the house was quiet again for the long-awaited trip to become a reality. Ed and Martha chose to purchase a used motorhome for their journey, and because Ed was frugal, he managed to get a great deal. A penny saved is a penny earned, Ed often quoted, wagging a finger in the air. They planned for days and drew out their routes and backup routes on the map. They packed food, spare fuel, tires, tools, and everything they thought they would need. Early the next morning, they double-checked everything after a big breakfast and set off, ready to enjoy what the open road had to offer. And it was, indeed, everything they'd ever wanted. During their trip, they decided on a whim to take the back roads to add an extra layer of adventure. Ed thought it was a great idea, 
and pointed to an alternative route on the map. Martha was hesitant at first, but eventually she agreed. They drove all day, but didn't come across a single soul. Only trees, rolling hills, and the weathered pavement before them. For an instant, Martha thought of asking Ed to turn back, but she knew they'd gone too far. Soon, the night took hold, and they barreled through the empty stretch of highway under the stars. But despite the circumstances, they were prepared for such a predicament. Ed checked the fuel gauge and noticed the tank was low, so he pulled off the side of the road and activated the emergency light. He shuffled out into the crisp air, opened the storage compartment and unstrapped the gas can. He filled up the fuel tank as he whistled and looked up at the full moon in the sky. Branches snapped in the darkness behind him and he shot a worried look over his shoulder while his mind conjured up a whole host of possible scenarios. Ed dropped the gas can and fumbled with the flashlight, aiming the beam at the autumn tree line, scanning it side to side. But there was nothing there. He set the dripping gas can upright, strained his ears to listen, and waited. But nothing happened. He knew it was most likely animals in the forest, but he felt uneasy just the same. Ed emptied the remaining fuel into the tank and flew back into the RV. Martha lay back in the passenger seat with a coat draped over her, one eye open. She could see that Ed was uneasy, the way he gripped the wheel and sweat rolled off his face. But she thought it best not to upset him further, so she closed her eyes and soon fell asleep. They drove through the night, and eventually the soft pastel colours pushed back the darkness as morning broke. Martha shifted in her seat and woke to the rising sun, the light falling onto her face. The old couple greeted each other, and before long they came across a faded sign that pointed to a nearby town. They turned off the highway and made their way, delighted to find a moment to stretch their legs and explore somewhere new. They drove down a dirt road for several miles until they found the town they were looking for, but it looked deserted. Martha opened up the map and checked the location, but couldn't find the town anywhere. Carriages sat along the empty streets, surrounded by old buildings and stables. Pine trees covered the landscape, tall and ominous. And at the centre of it all was a large church that gleamed white as they approached, blackbirds cawing loudly on its peak. The RV began to shake and make strange noises. Then the motor sputtered and died on the spot. The brakes hissed as the RV coasted for several metres and came to a halt. Ed cranked the key over and over, but nothing happened. Uh, might be the fuel pump, he said to his wife, who was not amused. Can you fix it, Ed? she asked in a soft voice. He shrugged his shoulders, then jumped out to open the hood and take a quick look. Upon inspection, there didn't seem to be anything wrong at all. No loose wires or leaking fluids. Everything as it should be. He paused to look around, and then noticed the church door was ajar. A thin arm reached out and held it open. Then a man emerged and stared in their direction. Ed opened the RV door, and Martha sat with a hopeful look. Go on, he said. Let's see if we can ask where to find the nearest mechanic. I'm not sure they have one around here, he finished under his breath. She shot him an unamused look then climbed down from the motorhome, smoothed out her skirt, and combed her wavy white hair. Together, in hand, they walked in eerie silence. The old church looked remarkable for its age, and the thick slabs of lumber did not show any signs of wear. The white paint seemed to glow in the sunlight, while the black birds flapped their wings and circled above. A man in a traditional grey suit held the door open for them, his face obscured by the hat he wore. They could hear music from within the church, the old organ straining to produce a note in tune. Many people filled the church and occupied every seat within. The couple wanted to ask for help, but decided the polite thing to do would be to wait until the service was over. They hoped to remain against the back wall, out of sight, 
but the man in grey shooed them way to the front. The occupants of the first row slowly condensed and shifted over to accommodate the old couple. Ed plopped down next to the aisle, and Martha had a seat next to a woman that wore a yellow dress and broad-brimmed hat. The woman's white-gloved hands rested on her lap, clasped together, her head bowed in prayer. Ed looked back and noticed everyone had their heads down as well, and so they did the same. The organ crawled to a stop and revealed low rumbling of an approaching storm. They waited in uncomfortable silence for the priest to begin, but he never did. He remained there with his head down, as did everyone else, while the interior of the church grew dark. Some time passed, and they began to grow restless. Martha decided to ask the woman beside her if another Bible happened to be lying around. She leaned over to touch her arm, and slowly the woman lifted her head to meet Martha's gaze. Thunder boomed, then lightning flashed above them. For a brief moment, the church was bathed in bright light. Empty sockets stared back at Martha inside a withered face that peered out from beneath the large hat. The sunken nose revealed the nasal cavity beneath, and large teeth protruded from the tight skin around her mouth. She pulled back her lips to speak, but no words came out, and then her jaw opened disturbingly wide. Martha screamed while Ed held her. Then they noticed everyone in the church had turned to face them, more flashes of light tore across the sky, illuminating the sunken faces that stared with empty eyes. The thunder roared and grew louder as the figures strained to rise, making their way to the couple one step at a time. Even children were among them, arms raised with tiny hands reaching out. A fierce wind howled outside, and the boards of the old building rattled and shook. Martha could smell smoke, and looked upward to see an orange glow suddenly engulf the roof. She felt as if she were looking through a portal into hell itself, faces in the flames. Don't leave, they shouted in ragged voice. Stay with us, more of them begged and pleaded. The couple jumped to their feet and made their way to the door, frightened out of their minds. Ed held onto his wife's hand and pulled her along while he barreled through the crowd of the dead. The figure shrieked and moaned as the couple ran by and burst through the double doors. Rain fell down on them in torrents, while the ghouls followed close behind. In all the commotion, Martha looked back for a moment and lost her balance. Her ankle folded beneath her and she tumbled to the ground with a hard thud. She shrieked in pain as the dead approached and reached out for her, but Ed swooped in to pick her up into his big arms at the last moment. They rushed toward the RV, out of breath, and jumped in through the driver's side door. As it shut, several hands wormed their way in and gripped onto Ed's arm. Stay, they screeched, locking eyes with him through the window but he remained vigilant while he partially opened the door and slammed it shut with all his strength over and over again. He broke and severed the rotten fingers that held him. Then finally the hands retreated, and Ed locked the doors. He sat there in a daze and closed his eyes for a moment, then turned to look at the church. The once white edifice had now become a giant fireball that reached up into the heavens. Blackbirds circled the red sky while the dead rocked the RV, silhouetted against the giant flames. He fought hard to understand what was happening, and at that moment he was overwhelmed as the smell of smoke and decay hit him like a punch to the gut. Gaunt faces pressed into the windows on either side of them, rotten hands hammering down with tremendous force. The glass began to crack under the stress, and their hearts sank. He tried the ignition again, but still nothing. 
Ed screamed at the RV to start, while Martha trembled in the passenger seat. He slammed his fist into the dashboard, then cranked the key and fluttered the gas pedal. To his relief, the motor roared to life. Jubilant, he hit the accelerator to the floor, and the tires spun in the rain, the RV launching forward. They sped away from the fiery church, hearts racing as they watched it all disappear from view. They reached the nearest town a few hours later. When Ed parked the car, they sat in silence for a while. Then he reached out and offered a hand to Martha. She took it and smiled weakly, letting everything sink in. They wanted to cleanse the day from their memory, yet more questions formed in their minds. An old man sat in a rocking chair outside the town general store, and a scruffy dog lay curled up at his feet. The man had a long white beard down to his waist, and took puffs from a wooden pipe as he rocked back and forth. The couple asked about any strange towns in the area, then began to open up about their bizarre encounter. The man stopped and lifted his head, turning his milky white eyes towards them. You must be in a small town south of here, he said in a rough accent. Ravensville, it was called at the time, on account of the only animals that came around was them. It was a bustling town back in the day, you know. Such a shame what happened. The old man knocked the empty pipe against the chair, filled it up, and then lit it again. He took a few puffs before he continued. Ah, I was a young'un when I heard it. Not something you want to hear at that age. About ninety odd years ago, the whole town gathered for Sunday Mass when a terrible storm hit. They barricaded themselves inside, and the building held against the winds well enough. Best anyone could figure. The townsfolk were trapped inside when the whole place caught fire. Everyone in town died in that church. The old man narrowed his eyes and sharpened his tongue. Don't you ever go back. That place belongs to the dead. So once again, a massive, massive thank you to all of you who've joined the subreddit and everyone that shares stories with me. Um, I've been exclusively reading from there for quite a while now, and I hope you will all enjoy the stories, because um, it's something I'm going to keep doing, really. A lot of other people doing stuff from uh, No Sleep and Creepypasta, so it's only fair that I give those of you who share stuff with me a chance on the channel. (laughs) Well, seems to be going okay, doesn't it? Well, of course, I will be back again on Wednesday, but that's enough for me for one evening. So, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay?